Open your Bibles to Jonah, the minor prophet, Old Testament book of Jonah. We're going to do four weeks in Jonah. Chapter 1 tonight. Thomas Paine said this, The story of the great fish swallowing Jonah borders greatly on the marvelous, but it would have approached nearer to the idea of a miracle if Jonah had swallowed the great fish. So the idea is that it's nothing for God to do a miracle. Uh, people seem to think that uh, this idea of being swallowed by a great fish is, uh, is kind of crazy. And everybody tries to prove that there's some living animal that could actually do this. I think there's a movie about him now, Megalodon, it's coming out on Friday, but no, I'm just kidding. But uh, when we get to that part of the story, we'll see that the, the answer simply is that God prepared a fish is what the Bible says. And so um, God obviously able to do this. And um, uh, Jonah is, in fact, a historical account. It's a true story. The events in it, including him being swallowed and surviving, are real. And they have to be because Jesus himself referred to Jonah as a prophet and his experiences as literal. He pointed his critics to Jonah's experience three days and three nights in the fish. And so unless Jesus didn't know what he was talking about, of course there are liberal theologians who suggest that, that Jesus didn't know the higher criticisms and he was stuck in the mythologies of his day. Uh, but in fact, Jesus literally gave credibility to Jonah's entire account. It is altogether true. And we'll talk about it when we get there. At the same time, Jonah's literal experiences are also an illustration of spiritual truth. For example, Jonah illustrates the past, present, and future history of the nation of Israel. The Jews were commissioned by God to be a witness to the surrounding Gentile nations, but they refused. A lot of people forget that it wasn't just to have a special people separate from all peoples uh, that God raised up Israel, but it also to reach the other nations with the message of truth. And thus they were thrown into the sea, in a sense, typical of the Gentile world, and swallowed up by the nations. We see that in their history. Still, they were not destroyed. They survived, and they survive to this day. And Israel will eventually emerge and be a blessing to the nations of the world as God originally intended. And as I mentioned, Jesus used Jonah's experience in the belly of the great fish to illustrate his own death, burial, and resurrection, saying that the only sign he would give the Jews was that of the prophet Jonah. And so it's a genuine story, historically accurate. All of it actually happened just as it's recorded, but it also has typology and figures as well. There's a Jewish legend, and that's all it is, but it's interesting, that Jonah was the widow's son whom Elijah brought back to life. Whether that is true or not, he is assumed to have been a disciple of Elisha, who followed Elijah. So Jonah had uh, quite the pedigree. In Jonah's time, Israel had split into two kingdoms. They called the northern kingdom Israel. Ten tribes in the north were Israel and two tribes in the south were Judah, Israel and Judah. The division weakened both of them. From the mid eighth century BC, all the kingdoms of that region came under increasing threat from the expanding Assyrian Empire. The kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians in 722 BC. Its capital city was destroyed and both biblical and Assyrian sources speak of massive deportations of Jews from that region. Replacement settlers were brought in from other parts of the empire and there was a great deal of intermarrying. Uh, and that's why in the time of Jesus you get to the point where uh, the Jews in Jerusalem in the southern uh, part don't really like the northern Jews from Samaria because there was a lot of intermarriage. Now the Assyrians, they were arguably the cruelest, most brutal nation on the face of the earth, uh, certainly at that time. This is a quote from one of Assyria's own kings, Ashurbanipal. They did have cool names though, I like their names. Ashurbanipal, found in records which have survived to the present time, he said, I pierced their captured leader with my keen hand dagger. Through his jaw I passed a rope, I put a dog chain upon him and made him occupy a kennel. And so that's how they treated uh, their adversaries. No Geneva Convention. Uh, it was brutal, brutal warfare. And so you didn't want to be captured by the Assyrians. 
Around 780, 750 BC, God ordered Jonah to reach out to the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, which he famously refused to do. What was God thinking? Well, he tells you what he was thinking in the very last verse of the book, if you want to peek ahead, but I'll read it to you. Jonah 4.11, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. And so God talks about those that are before the age of discernment and, and whatnot and even animals. And he says, I am a God of compassion. The word pity is compassion. God singled out the worst people on the face of the earth and said, I have compassion for them. I, all of us would probably have a different answer, but whoever you think the worst group of people on earth is today, whether they're domestic or foreign, God would say to you, I have compassion for them. And if God has compassion for them, what do we assume? that we are to have compassion for them as well. Now God puts compassion in action by giving his prophet a commission, go. Jonah is about God's compassion for souls and the commission of his servants to reach them. And so that puts us in the story pretty easily. God's compassion remains in effect today. God so loved the world that he did what? Sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And God commissioned uh, his commission remains in effect today. Go therefore and do what? Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so uh, Jonah, exactly what God told Jonah to do, uh, God has told us to do. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament, the assignments are the same. God is reaching out to lost men and women all over the globe so that he can bring them into his forever family. Um, so let's get into the book starting in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah understood God's compassion, and I'm going to tell you from the beginning, Jonah did not want the Assyrians spared and saved, and that's why he attempted to flee from God's commission. In the New Testament, the disciples were given a commission by the risen Lord. It's in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you remember. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Commissioned to take the gospel to the end of the earth, they remained in Jerusalem, perhaps reluctant to go to the Gentiles. God shook up their world. Stephen was stoned to death. A storm of persecution broke out upon the church in Jerusalem, and then they were scattered abroad and began preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, and, and so, um, though we uh, criticize Jonah, and rightfully so, the church is often guilty of this same reluctance. Uh, I don't want to call it rebellion necessarily, but there's oftentimes a reluctance to go where God is desiring to send us. And so in verse 3, Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. That's a funny line, isn't it? He was going to flee from the presence of the Lord. I guess he hadn't read his Psalms in a while. I mean, where can, where can you go that the Lord isn't there? Uh, but he tried to do that. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Tarshish is probably the coast of southern Spain. And so he was headed west as far as you could go in those days, about 2,500 miles. And so God said, Joan, I've got an assignment for you. You're a prophet. You're a notable prophet. He's mentioned in the book of Kings. Uh, you've got a great heritage. Uh, you, you come from the, being a disciple of Elisha. Who wouldn't love that? I'm sending you. It's a special assignment. It's like, you know, you're, you're the guy to go to Nineveh. And Jonah says, I hear Tarshish calling. And so he heads the other direction as fast as he possibly At least he got right up and into it. You know, he didn't linger. He went for it. He found a ship. He could afford the fare. And he could sleep in peace while he was on that vessel. And that all adds up to tell us that circumstances can be deceiving. You cannot determine God's will for your life merely by circumstances. I'm not saying they can't be important, that God doesn't use them. He certainly does. But that cannot be your single motive for knowing God's will. His will is found first and foremost in his word. 
You live on principle, not on perception. Christians too often allow circumstances to comfort them while they are actively disobeying God. It's clear Jonah was actively disobeying God, and yet from one point of view, everything fell into place. If Jonah was in my office today, he would say that his sin was uh, uh, not that big of a deal because look at his circumstances. If God really wanted me to go to Nineveh, how come there was a ship going to Tarshish and I had the fare to pay and I have, I have such peace about it? And this is the thing people really rest on now is their feelings. I feel good about this. How can it be so wrong when it feels so right? And that's where we go back to God's word and say, what does God's word specifically and explicitly say about this? Sometimes I've asked people, what would you tell someone else? in your situation. Well, I would tell them that they don't have any grounds for a divorce, but that they're not me. And uh, I think that it's gonna be okay and God's gonna cover it. And, and so be careful about uh, interpreting circumstances as if they're tea leaves or, or some kind of tarot cards or something like that. Start with the word of God. Uh, Peter says everything that we need for life and godliness is in there. Uh, and once you know what God wants you to do as a principle, then you can add your circumstances to the mix. Verse four, the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, lay down and was fast asleep. Now these were experienced sailors. They ate storms for lunch. How many of you watch Deadliest Catch? Or have ever watched it? I, I am addicted to that show, even though every week it's the exact same show. Them trying to catch crab, and, and then you think, oh, now it's Opelio, the elusive Opelio crab. But I look at that, I mean those boats are hunks of junk, nothing holding them together, hydraulic fluid leaking all over the place, electrical fires left and right, they got 30 foot waves and I don't even know the knots of the wind and, and they're going up and down and all. How do they not break in half? I don't understand why those guys aren't all dead. But their experience sailed, they love it. They can't wait to go up there, not just for the money, it's a lifestyle. That's these guys. These guys were used to sailing through storms. Jonah was asleep. Now these guys realized that this was unlike any storm they had ever experienced. They, it passed a point of, of being even, the wor even worse than the worst storm that they could imagine. And they thought, hey, there is something supernatural going on about this situation. And once their own skill failed, they cried out to their God. They were brought to the point of understanding that there are spiritual realities. Terror and tragedy prepare the unbelieving hearts for truth. They strip away sources of strength and expose the failure of belief systems. Now, don't get caught in the trap of telling people God brought this hurricane to reach you with the gospel. Uh, we live in a fallen world. Now, I've explained many times that our viewpoint is that God is in charge of everything, but because of his compassion for sinners, he lets sin continue for a time. He will stop all of those things at one point, but in the meantime, horrible things happen and they don't happen by the direct design of God. And let me just get graphic with you. You're never gonna tell somebody that God desired for them to be raped, right? I mean, what, what, do you, does anybody believe that? There are people who believe things like that, that God is a strict determinist and that everything happens, happens by his divine design. And yet we would back up and say, wait a minute, everything happens because there's sin in the world and God allows these things to go on, but he is not the direct cause of them. It's no comfort to anybody to tell them that the terrible tragedy that happened to them, God planned to happen to them so that they would turn to him. But in these tragedies, what does happen? People understand their own frailty, that their life is a vapor, it appears but for a moment and then vanishes away, and it is an opportunity to reach them with the gospel. And so the captain came to Jonah and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God, perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. So their gods had failed, and so they, somebody told the captain that Jonah was asleep. The unbelieving captain rightly guessed that Jonah's God was not willing any should perish, 
And so he went to Jonah with God's message of compassion when all the while it was Jonah who had been sent to Nineveh with that same message. There's, this is the ironic chapter of the Bible. If you want to find irony, this is it. Jonah, go to uh, Nineveh with compassion because I have compassion on all men. And so this unbelieving captain who's just been praying to Poseidon probably finds Jonah and says, hey, pray to your God because he doesn't want anybody to perish in this storm. And Jonah, it just, he has to have his mind blown. Couldn't miss the irony. He had tried to avoid sharing with Gentiles who were perishing, but God busted him. If he wouldn't go to the Gentiles, God would bring Gentiles to him. And that's exactly what he did in the form of this captain and his crew. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? So he said, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Right about now, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land was just who you needed if you wanted to get through this sea to dry land. God was forcing Jonah to give testimony to Gentiles. As terrible as the storm and potential loss of life, you have to see the humor in this. He didn't want to preach to Nineveh for reasons we'll get into. These guys are Gentiles, and he is forced. God forces a testimony, and he has to tell them who he is and who he believes in and, and, and his, his statements are right on. And then verse 10. The men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. No child of God should ever suffer the humiliation of being reproved by a non-believer. You and I have all been there. Where you just, you've blown it or something's happened and some non-believing family member or some non-believing neighbor or co-worker says those faithful words, I thought you were a Christian. And then you're thinking, yeah, I thought I was too. How do I explain this, you know? Uh, and sometimes you just have to humble yourself. Uh, but no one wants that humiliation. Nevertheless, God uses you when it suits its purposes. Uh, verse 11, then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. The sea was angry that day. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Now I'm not sure this was the only answer. In fact, I know it wasn't. Because the real answer was to turn the ship around and Jonah repent and go to Nineveh because that's what he would eventually do anyway. Uh, and so Jonah could have repented right then and said, you know, Lord, just from the point of view of what he was doing to this Gentile crew, he was risking their lives because of his personal desire to not serve the Lord. Lord, I am so not going to serve you that I don't care if people have to die because of it. And so Jonah could have just said, hey, turn the ship around. I need to go to Nineveh. As soon as I say those words, as soon as I repent, I bet the sea grows calm. But instead he says, you're going to have to kill me. Uh, you know, and, and I think he's really talking to God in a sense. He's saying, you know, if you, you, you want to you raise the stakes, then kill me. I would rather die than go to Nineveh. Hard. Jonah is as hardcore a disobedient prophet as it gets. Your sin always involves and affects others. That's something that... Uh, I think we need to settle in on sometimes. Yeah, I, most people who are sinners, like us, we generally don't want to hurt other people. We just enjoy our sin. We need to remind ourselves that when I am sinning, when I am selfish, it affects everybody else that I have a relationship with. And so for no other reason than that, I should repent and walk with the Lord so that I don't hurt my wife or my husband or my children or my relatives or my church or whatever it might be. You know, if, if somebody came to you and said, hey, how would you like to hurt everybody you know so deeply and meaningfully, like putting a knife into their gut and twisting it, how would you like? And you say, no, of course I don't want to do that. And then maybe like Nathan, the person should say, well, then why are you in this sin? Why are you pursuing this course? Because that's exactly what you're doing. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. These pagan sailors put Jonah to shame. 
They cared more for him than he for them. They were not willing for him to perish, even though he had put them in harm's way and had hid the message of salvation from them. Jonah said, throw me overboard and all this will end. And they, and they didn't do it. They had compassion. They were decent individuals. They said, well, that can't be the answer. We're not going to murder you. We're gonna, we'll row against the storm, even though we know that's probably not going to work. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. They had a respect for the sanctity of human life. They acted slowly and deliberately and prayerfully. Seems odd that they threw him overboard until you see the spiritual truth being illustrated. Remember that Jesus would later use the story of Jonah to illustrate his own death and burial and resurrection. In order for these sailors to be safe, Jonah would die. In order for them to be saved, Jesus would have to die. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Now, I like to think that it was immediate, like the miracles that Jesus did. One minute, uh, not, not just, you know, sometimes you think of gradual calming and, and stuff. I think it was just bam. It was like glass. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and took vows. I would say these sailors are converted because, number one, they feared God, which is used as an expression of saving faith. They offered a sacrifice, which was the proper way to approach God, and they took vows. If they had taken vows before the sea grew calm, I would be suspicious. We've all done that before we were Christians. Oh, God, if you're there, if you get me through this, I will serve you. <laughs> Fingers crossed behind my back. But these guys took vows after the sea calmed. And it was after the trouble had passed. And so they indicate a true conversion. Again, please note the irony. The very thing Jonah had wanted to avoid had now come to pass. God used him to minister his grace to the Gentiles, and they got saved. Too bad Jonah wasn't there to see it because he was now bobbing around in the ocean. Jonah, Jonah, it says, was languishing. Languishing means to grow dull, to no longer be active and vigorous, to lose strength. You see Jonah languishing. He was sleeping on a ship headed for Tarshish when he should have been serving in the city of Nineveh. God shook up his world to arouse him from languishing. And so, you know, as an application, wherever you are, you can consider that your Nineveh. Thankfully, no one is piercing your jaw with keen daggers and kenneling you like a dog. Probably. If you're in a situation like that, please let us know. We'll help you. Uh, but, you know, I, you face a lot of terrible things at work, uh, at school, you know, overbearing employers and employees and you know, just terrible stuff happening and stuff. But, but you're not a captive of the, Nineveh, or of the, of the Assyrian Empire. And, and so, you know... It, hold off on how bad things really are. As bad as things might seem, your boss or your teacher is not flaying you and spreading your skin on the wall and doing things like that. And so sometimes I think Christians, I, I guess I, I think I'm okay to say this, so we just need to toughen up a little bit. I, I wish we could all spend a few minutes with the Apostle Paul and just say, Paul, just having such a rough time. Oh, let me tell you about rough times. Did you just get stoned to death? Well, no, not exactly. Were you just in prison? No. Were you robbed and left naked? No. H have you been beaten like uh, a, a million times? No. So what exactly is your idea of t you know, having a rough time? Well, this, this boss that I work for, I asked for some time off and he said no. Oh, yeah, I can see where that would really shake you to the core. They criticized your work. They didn't treat you like a human being. I mean, Paul's liable to jump you. I mean, just say, hey, let me show you what this feels like. But, so, you know, I, 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 at the same time, I want to be compassionate. I hope you're compassionate towards me. We, I understand that certain things do cause pain. But sometimes I think we need to still talk about it and say, you know, I, I need to toughen up. This is really nothing. And especially if it's for Christ's sake. If I'm suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ, 
Then the apostles, they, say, they rejoiced. They said, hey, guys, do you realize we just got beat up for Jesus? Yeah, let's go again. How can we do that again? Don't worry, it'll happen. All you have to do is keep sharing the gospel. So in, the, in your Nineveh, whatever that means to you, don't languish. Be moved with a message of compassion. Discover your method of communicating it to those who are perishing. God is bringing people to you. Uh, it's better for you to do it in humility than in humiliation. Amen?